Hi, folks. We are just about to get started. Thank you for being here for this Methods Mondays. Um, yeah, my name is Audrey Williams. I am a PhD candidate here at the Carter School. Um, and uh, yeah, so Methods Mondays is a um, is a, a series that we do at the Carter School. Uh, to look at different methodologies that we might be using in the peace and conflict studies realm, um, to think about also different considerations that uh, we think about with methodology. Uh, we are very lucky to be in an interdisciplinary field, but that also means we've got a lot of things to choose from um, and don't always uh, know where to start. So we always hope that these can be, um, for folks who are more uh, familiar with methodologies, a good a uh, way to kind of uh, think about new things. And then for those for whom this is an introduction to really think about, okay, is that something I wanna do? Um, is it something I wanna kind of have uh, in the back of my mind? Uh, and what are, especially the ethics. And um, today we'll be talking in particular about ethics. So today um, our presenter is Dr. Leslie Dwyer. Um, Dr. Dwyer is an associate professor at the Carter School. She holds a PhD in anthropology and has conducted ethnographic work on survivors of mass violence and transi transitional justice, um, on modernist Islamic movements for social justice, on gender-based violence, and on conflicts over natural resource extraction in Indonesia. And today, Dr. Dwyer will be speaking about ethnographic approaches to knowledge that are rooted in feminist principles of care and interdependence, and how we can work to dismantle extractive methodologies that center value primarily in the corporeal and scholarly body of the researcher. In this session, Dr. Dwyer will draw upon her own experience as an ethnographer and will engage participants in dialogue about how we might envision liberatory methodologies grounded in care ethics. So, um, the way this will go is uh, Dr. Dr. Dwyer will uh, speak with us, um, and then we'll have chance uh, as an audience to do a Q&A and just kind of get a, a better sense of what um, this kind of ethics of care looks like. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Dwyer. Thank you so much, Audrey. Um, and thank you. I recognize um, some of the folks who have joined and you know, others, I'm, I'm really super glad to meet you and to have this conversation today. Um, as you were talking, Audrey, about what I had planned to put together for today, um, I'll, do, I'll do my best to get through all of it. I realized that I was so excited to come and talk about ethnography, which is one of my passions, um, and to also talk about feminist approaches to research and to talking about care and how that shows up in our research. Um, I, I will do my best to, 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 talk, to talk through all of it, and I want to at least leave some room for a conversation at the end. Um, so to start off, I wanted to actually just pose a question, and you could just use your Zoom hand here. Um, how many of you have, have done ethnographic research? How many of you are thinking, okay, two, I know, Shelly, definitely, I know. Um, Shelly is one of our PhD alums who has done ethnographic research. Super glad to have you here, Shelly. And Faria, um, how many of you are thinking that you may incorporate an ethnographic approach into a research project? Okay, that's awesome. All right. Um, so I'm really glad to talk about this. I did a million years ago, back in like the ancient days of the Carter School, I actually had the opportunity to teach an elective on ethnography. Um, but since then, just the, the way in which our, our course load is structured as faculty haven't had the chance to do that again. Um, but I do work with a lot of graduate students on ethnographic projects. So if that is something that you are particularly interested in, I would be more than happy to talk to you just in general. Um, let me just put my email in the chat because I did not put it on my um, PowerPoint. Um, so it's ldwire2 at gmu.edu. Um, and so, yes, my PhD, my PhD is in and my master's degree and my bachelor's degree we were all in cultural anthropology. So this is something um, that I have some deep training in. And I want to talk a little bit about sort of how this works um, by way of sharing uh, one of my research projects, working with survivors of the 1965-1966 mass violence, genocidal mass violence in Indonesia. Um, and this is a long-term project. 
that I've been doing really since the early 2000s. Um, and this is one of the things that I found about ethnography is that it becomes in so many ways um, part of your life rather than just something you do as, as your day job. Um, and this is in part where, where care shows up for me um, and the ways in which I've sort of been pulled into these, these deep longstanding relationships that are academic, but that are also activist, um, that are also familial, that are also part, part of building a community. So I wanna talk about um, a number of things here. So first I wanted to talk about feminist research. I know that this is something that folks are also interested in trying to explore. So I wanna just give a couple of definitions. Um, and then again, I wanna talk through some of my own work and how this has showed up. And then I wanna ask you all how this may be showing up in your own work. So, you know, just very, very quickly for those of you who maybe have not had a chance to take a course in gender or who haven't thought much about feminist approaches, a very simple definition from Bell Hooks, um, a Black feminist scholar who has, has really been foundational in thinking about feminism. Um, she defines feminism just really as the movement to end sexism, sexual exploitation, and sexual oppression, period. Um, and there's a lot, and she does a lot in her work, if you are, ever have read Bell Hooks's work, um, she does a lot of unpacking of what this looks like in people's lives, how this shows up in our own lives as scholars, as well as in the lives of the people that we work with. Um, and then feminist research building on that works to try to understand these structures that Hooks is talking about. So works to try to understand what is sexism how does that get embedded in social structures, political structures? Um, how does that get embedded in our everyday lives and our ways of thinking about ourselves and our ways of thinking about others? Um, how does sexual exploitation, sexual oppression, how does that, how does that work? Um, so feminist research is trying to understand how those structures operate in people's lives and how they also intersect with other dynamics of oppression, whether that's racism, whether that's colonialism, um, whether that's heterosexism, transphobia, how does that link up and how does that, um, how does that operate? And so a feminist research perspective is grounded in trying to unravel, identify, and then ideally give us some ideas for how to work against um, some of those dynamics of oppression. So really thinking about also how power works by presuming in this kind of false universalizing way that one group of people's experience is going to be the same as everybody's experience, right? So that we could look at, let's say, in my case, survivors of genocide and presume somehow that there weren't other structures of power and oppression that were making those experiences, in many cases, very, very different. That's making how people were targeted during genocide different. That's making it different for in terms of how they recover, how they work together. So feminist research uh, really is not just about, let's say, adding women to the mix or what people oftentimes call adding women in stir. It's really looking at how power locates itself so often in gendered structures, gendered ways of practice, gendered ways of thinking, um, and trying to do some unraveling of some of those structures. Of course, we could, you know, scholars have written whole books on this. We could take a whole course. And there are whole courses in, in Mason's Women and Gender Studies on feminist research approaches, but that's just kind of a, a brief overview of some of the things that a feminist perspective looks like. Um, I think it's also to, interesting to think about the relationship of feminist research and theory. Um, and so this is a long quote from somebody whose work I really appreciate and who I teach in my gender classes. Her name is Sarah Ahmed. Um, and actually, she doesn't have an A at the end of Sarah. That's a typo, sorry. But this is from her book called Living a Feminist Life. Um, and I won't read the quote. You know, you can read it here on the screen. But she's really interested in thinking about how theory plays a role, even in our methods, right? How we think about theory, what we assume it is, and the way in which theory oftentimes functions to create a kind of closed system of citation where, you know, I'm citing somebody who's known to be a theorist, whether that's, you know, Foucault or Galtung or Butler or um, Burton or somebody sort of in our conflict resolution world, 
And then my citation of that and my engagement with that person's work then becomes theory by it gets legitimized as theory by virtue of that kind of citational politics. And so what Ahmed is pointing us to is about thinking about the work and the practices and the thinking of people outside of those sort of citational circles and how we might also think about that as theory producing. Um, and again, I'll talk about this in relation to my own work. How this shows up for me in my own work is thinking about the relationship of, of the everyday um, to politics, to feminism, to research methods, and really thinking about the everyday as a space of knowledge production, not just of data, but also of people who are theorizing, who are making their way through their social and political worlds, um, giving us concepts, giving us ideas that we can incorporate into, into their work. And I also think about this as one of the hallmarks of the kind of ethnography that I'm invested in, that I do, is really not simply positioning myself as sort of the global North scholar who's responsible for the theory generation. And then the people who I'm working with, let's say in Indonesia, are the ones who are providing me with data that I'm going to appropriate, that I'm going to turn into a dissertation, I'm gonna turn it into a book, I'm gonna turn it into a presentation like this, right? That I'm going to use for my cultural capital as a scholar, I'm gonna put it on my CV, you know, I'm going to be the one who theorizes, I'm going to be the one who knows, and then the people who I'm working with are, are providing me with that kind of raw material for that grist, for that, the raw material grist for that kind of mill, which I want to argue is, is primarily an extractive colonial form of, of knowledge production. So how do we take seriously that every day? How do we take seriously, and this is an image from my work in, in Indonesia, um, you know, this is women who are typically in charge of Hindu Balinese uh, ritual functions. That's kind of their, their domain. Um, and they're going to the beach to make offerings to the gods. Um, and they're doing this in the aftermath of mass violence, where working with the, um, the sort of supernatural, the realm of the invisible beings is a primary way that women work to heal, to create community um, in the aftermath of, of mass violence. I'll get more into that. Um, but really taking seriously, how do we see power? How do we see gendered power? How do we see political power sort of working in these everyday spaces? How do we identify resistances to power, which are also taking place, not just in the public um, kind of spectacular formal jo domain, but in these very ordinary enactments of life, of work, of relatedness, of how we build relationships with each other? Um, and then also, how are these resistances very often made invisible or seen as irrelevant, how they're sort of pushed out of our scholarly field? Like, that's not really what we do in conflict resolution. You know, going to the beach with, with your family, with your community and making offerings to the gods, like, that's not really conflict resolution. You know, conflict resolution is something that takes place around this mythical, like, track one peace negotiations table, right? So I'm really interested in not seeing it that way, but in opening up spaces where we can really start to see um, how, how politics actually infiltrates the everyday and to take that seriously as a site, not just of data, but also of theoretical production. Um, and please stop me if I'm sort of skimming over anything, because like this is a very kind of quick overview of something that I feel like, you know, we could have conversations that could go on for for days about, right, you know, how conflict resolution, how academia in general has created um, theory and ways in which our methodological approaches can kind of open up the box um, to see things that we might not otherwise have seen. Um, so then I want to talk a little bit about care and how that comes in here. Um, so this quote on the bottom right of the screen is from Audre Lorde, um, who is a Black feminist, was a Black feminist poet activist who was very, very influential um, in sort of the world of feminist thinking, also in the world of, of especially thinking intersectionally about the experiences of, of specifically of Black women, of BIPOC women, 
but she's got this great quote and you may have seen it somewhere. I've seen it in a lot of different places, right? I've seen it sort of stamped onto candles and, um, you know, put on stickers, right? As well as in scholarly text. But she has this great quote, which says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. <laughs> and, and this idea of care as an act of political warfare, rather than something which is outside of the domain of politics, outside of the domain of our scholarly work, right? Something that we do, you know, at 7.30 at night after we turned off the laptop, stopped reading, you know, we shut, we shut the laptop and we go take like a bubble bath and light some candles, right? Um, and that's seen as like personal, not something that's political. You know, she really kind of brings in this feminist, uh, dictum of the personal as the political, um, but then sort of makes it even more intense by saying this is our act of political warfare to take care of ourselves within structures that oftentimes through systems of misogyny, through systems of homophobia, um, through racism, through transphobia in a world shaped by war, by climate disaster, by neoliberal capitalism, neocolonial extraction of value from the global south, at the bottom here of the screen, I have plus, 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 you know, um, sort of you name it, the ways in which um, our bodies, our communities, our well being are so oftentimes under threat. The sort of taking care of ourselves is essential. Um, early attempts to really think about this within feminist thought kind of drew on these very, what I want to call essentializing notions of, of women's care labor. Um, as a way to critique sort of mainstream moral philosophy. So saying, okay, women are more likely to do care labor. They're more likely maybe even to be caring. And so taking that seriously as a feminist researcher um, is, is important. Over the past, I wanna say like five to 10 years, there's been a really interesting explosion um, of thinking about how important this is collectively, the ways in which this isn't just my self-care, the ways this is about creating networks of mutual aid, of empathetic relatedness, um, not just with my scholarly colleagues, but also with the people who I'm working with, really thinking about research as the, the opportunity um, to build and to invest um, and to maybe be be sort of pulled into, sort of demanded to participate um, in networks of care, which I think is a very different approach, both politically, philosophically, and also methodologically, from the kind of classic version of the sort of armchair scholar or the helicopter scholar who sort of sits at home generating theory and then like pops into a so-called field site, right? You know, this, this kind of word field that we oftentimes use when we're talking about methodology, which has so many colonial underpinnings, right? You know, I'm in the metropolis, I'm going out to the field, I'm going out to the bush, right? You know, all of this resonant colonial, um, oftentimes uh, racial, racialized language. Um, rather than thinking of my work in that way, of thinking about these networks of care and relatedness to the people that I'm working with being ongoing, um, being, being, being consistent, um, sort of in, enduring and being very, very intentional. Um, so that's sort of my, where I'm coming from in terms of thinking about a, a feminist um, care ethics. And I can see some comments in the chat. I can respond to them a little bit later in, in the Q&A. Um, but if there's something that's burning for you um, and you want to raise a hand and, and pause me, um, please feel free to, to go ahead and, and do that. Um, so that's sort of my approach to thinking about a feminist care ethics and kind of how that might show up in general in our research. But what I want to talk about now is that it's really only going to make sense for me if I can ground this in the work that I actually do. Um, so as I said earlier, a long-term research project that I have been invested in um, is about the 1965 genocide in Indonesia. Um, and just to give, I'll show a couple of slides just to give you an overview if you're not familiar, but just raise your Zoom hand if you are familiar. And of course, Shelly, I know is, but 
um, I think probably most folks aren't. So Audrea's, Shelly, I'm raising hands on your behalf because I know you worked on this on your dissertation as well. Um, but it's kind of amazing how few people are familiar with what happened in Indonesia in the 1960s. Um, you know, I think that we take, we sort of look at some what, what become paradigmatic cases in the conflict analysis and resolution field, right? So I think it would be pretty hard to get a master's degree or certainly a PhD or even an undergraduate degree at the Carter School without knowing a little bit about Rwanda, without knowing a little bit about what happened in the Balkans, um, about knowing maybe a little bit even about Ukraine or knowing a little bit about, you know, what happened to maybe even in Vietnam, right, in the, in, in the 1960s in Southeast Asia. So there's some cases um, that almost become paradigmatic of how we're thinking about mass violence. But Indonesia, actually, um, the mass violence which took place there in which about a million Indonesians, we're not sure exactly how many, were killed over the span of about three months, um, ranks as, if you're ranking these things, as the eighth worst genocide of the 20th century. But most folks don't know this. And there's a whole, I could go off on a whole tangent about why this is true, the participation of the US, the UK, the, Austra the Australians um, in supporting the Indonesian military to carry out this widespread slaughter of those on the left who were alleged to be communists. Um, and so in, in many ways created some of the silences around this and makes it something that, that, we don't, that we don't know too much about. But this is what I've been working on for um, 20 plus years. And even when I try to work on something different and go off in another direction, sort of it pulls me back in because of these communities of interdependence and care that I've created over, over these decades of working on this. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background, so this was very much a, a military directed um, genocide, although with lots of participation of people at the local level. Um, so the military actually worked to bring very actively to bring civilians into the perpetration of violence. So some of the narratives that were used during the genocide called upon people to destroy an intimate enemy within the blanket. So that means, you know, someone you might share a blanket with at home. So this might be your wife, this might be your child, this might be your parent, um, right? To sort of not um, be bound by relations of care, to, to, to really um, try to call, destroy, um, uproot the Communist Party down, down to its very roots, wherever you might find it. Um, and so in the aftermath of genocide, what this did was that this really sort of pushed um, memories and experiences of violence very, very deep into intimate relations of family and community life. Um, what this looked like oftentimes was brothers killing brothers, um, neighbors killing neighbors. My husband, actually, his parents, his father was killed during the 1965 genocide. His mother was a political prisoner um, for many years. And the guy who, who was responsible for his death lives probably like 100 meters away, you know, meet him going to the market, you know, walking your kids to school. So this very sort of intimate relationships in terms of everyday life between perpetrators and victims. The other thing that was quite, um, the quite, oh, oh, here. So I wanted to say first, there's also about a million folks who were detained. So the mass the vast majority of whom were never brought to trial. Um, many of them were detained through the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, hundreds of thousands of them were, were just summarily executed there. I believe there are only two formal trials that were ever held. Um, but when folks were released, they were issued these identity cards that had codes on them marked with ex-political prisoners, political prisoner, and they were subject to very strict state and community surveillance. Um, which really in many ways has continued to the present. So, um, you know, talking about sort of entanglements, interdependencies, the ways in which one's research project um, shows up in one's life. I first started working on this because, as I said, um, I was married to somebody who, ha who was part of this history, whose parents were killed. Um, and then soon after we were married, and I, I had our first child. I went to go get an Indonesian passport for my kids. So my kids have American passports, but they also had Indonesian passports at the time. Um, and we went through this whole process with the immigration office 
in Indonesia where they're like, oh, I'm really sorry, like Mrs. Leslie, like this is going to be really hard because your kids are grandchildren of the Communist Party. And I'm like, what? Like, you know, my kids are born, you know, born in America. She, my daughter, my oldest daughter was born in America. You know, she's going to nursery school there. Like, what do you mean? She's a grandchild of the Communist Party. And so then I started working on this in some ways um, as a way to try to think about this legacy that had been bequeathed to my own children um, and to this community that I had been, become a part of through relations of marriage, but also through relations of care, through, through activism, um, to really try to, to, to understand. And so that's just an example of the ways in which, and my daughter was born, my oldest daughter was born in 1999. So even up through the early 2000s, and even arguably up until today, um, how there's been so much stigma against the left, so much stigma against people who are marked as, um, as being related to, sorry, to the Communist Party. Um, sorry. I was going to give a trigger warning for that, for that, actually, for this, for this next photograph. I wanted to talk specifically a little bit about the gendered politics of this. So women um, who were accused of affiliation with the Communist Party were subject to very particular kinds of violence, including sexual violence, including sexual torture and detention, um, forced concubinage, so being taken as basically like a sex slave for um, a perpetrator of violence. Um, those who lost husbands were subject to incredible stigma in their widowhood. Um, they were oftentimes, after they were released from prison, not allowed to return to their families or to their communities. Um, they were subject to accusations of witchcraft um, or the denial of custody of their children. So when they went home, um, were not allowed to we're not allowed to, to reclaim um, their children. Um, and so how this is framed in Indonesian official history, so in national dominant government sponsored history, is that it wasn't a genocidal episode. It wasn't genocidal mass violence. It wasn't a state sponsored massacre of a, of a million people. It was a nation under siege from communism. So think back to the 1960s, it was the height of the cold war. Um, and that what happened was that a valiant masculine military, sorry, a valiant masculine military under the command of cool. former president. Thank you. Oops, Brianna, I'm going to mute you. Um, under the command of Suharto, who is Indonesia's military dictator from 1966 to 1998, that the nation has had been saved from, from the specter of communism. Um, in the official history of the conflict, there is no acknowledgement of civilian deaths, of illegal civilian detentions, um, and then women's experience has been especially marginalized, even in activist discourse, um, in which there really has not been sufficient acknowledgement of the specific experiences of women, including sexual assault, because there's just so much stigma surrounding it. Um, there still is today, a dominant national discourse that warns people in Indonesia to be vigilant against the latent danger of communism, um, which legitimizes a military security response to all kinds of forms of activism. Um, you know, there still are ways in which activist movements are called or stamped with the stamp of communism, um, which for many people in Indonesia just sort of raises this very, very deep emotional sense of, of fear. So being marked as a communist, being called out as a communist um, is something that legitimizes violence against you, either by the state or by people in your community even. Um, so it's, it's, it's really also worked to dampen all forms of activism, especially women's activism in Indonesia. So um, that's the official history. The official history is also encoded. So this is in Jakarta, Indonesia's capital. This still stands today. Um, Shelly, I think you've been there probably, right? Um, the museum, the fabulous museum of communist treachery. Um, not really high on, on most tourists' agenda, um, but I've been there a, a number of times just to sort of see the way you know, school kids get brought here still. Um, the dioramas that are created at this museum were actually built to like, kind of junior high school kid height so that they could get like a, 
you know, a really, a really good view of these um, gruesome depictions of, of, of communist violence. Um, and so this is a particular relief at that museum, which is showing communist women dancing erotically in the top and the top middle, those are generals um, who the Communist Party allegedly captured and then threw down this well. And that was sort of the pretext um, for mass violence. But part of that narrative that was created was that women who are affiliated with the Communist Party um, did erotic dancing before they um, cut off the genitals of these generals and then and then threw them down a well. So this was part of constructing this figure um, of the sort of um, horrific, um, out of bounds uh, woman who could then be be suppressed politically. So this is this is just literally carved into stone. Um, and actually, former political prisoners were were forced to to work on um, some of these these reliefs and and, and murals and other um, and other pieces of this museum. Here's another one. So this is again part of this dominant narrative that gets created. And I'll tie this back to ethnography in a minute. Right now, I'm just talking about sort of the dominant narratives. Um, so the dominant narrative, which shows General Suharto, who who was soon to become president slash military dictator for 32 years. So he's directing um, this armed purge of communism. So you can sort of see, um, you can see like the, the tanks sort of moving in. And in the bottom right here, you see the nation's mothers and babies who he's doing this on behalf of to protect them. You know, they're cradling their, their, their babies in their arms. Um, in terms of Indonesian artistic iconography or sort of, or sort of um, gendered iconography, they have like this very neat hair, it's put back into like this respectable sort of bun. Um, so it's portraying mass violence as the imposition of order um, on chaos, especially, especially gendered, um, especially gendered chaos. Um, here's one of those dioramas that I was talking about, the ones that are kind of constructed for junior high school kids on field trips to go and look at. So this is a statue of a so-called communist woman at the Museum of Communist Treachery. Um, and I find this particular, what are these things called? Like wax works? Like, oh my gosh, I'm like losing my mind. Yeah, like Monday after, Monday after spring break, like lost an hour through um, daylight savings time. But like, yeah, it's like a wax work um, figure. Um, and you can see sort of there's some soldiers in the back in the back, but like she's amazing because in distinction to the to the to this bar relief here where these women like have this like tidy proper hair like her hair is wild it's loose it's messy it looks like she hasn't combed it she's wearing this sarong but it's like very threadbare like it's indicating that she's not just maybe poor, but she's also slovenly, like she doesn't take care of her appearance. She's got her sleeves like rolled up, right? And, you know, of course she's got like the knife in her hand. Um, she's got these sandals. And then if you look really close at, at this statue, she's actually got like fungus, like painted on her feet. Like she doesn't actually bathe. Like they actually took like a sort of white brush and like painted her. So she's got like foot fungus. So this is like the image of, of women, right? The dominant image of women um, as being sexually depraved, violent, um, not caring about their appearance, just sort of being out of bounds in terms of social order, a danger to, to the nation. So this is the dominant narrative. Um, and so ethnography, I think, can work to dismantle dominant narratives we see them everywhere. We have dominant narratives um, of, of sort of most things having to do with conflict, right? And so part of the work of ethnography um, can be, for instance, talking with women who were accused of communism, women who are part of the Communist Party. Um, even some of the work that I did was, was kind of an ethnographic archival approach where um, I, I had copies of the Indonesian Women's Communist Party journal, like going back through the 1950s and sort of seeing what communist women were actually talking about. And a lot of what they were actually talking about in their journals and what I, what I learned from oral histories, from ethnographic oral histories, was that they were talking about like vaccinations for kids, right? Like measles vaccinations. Um, 
they were talking about politics, but they were also talking about things that were very much everyday concerns um, about how to take care of your community, um, how to work against illiteracy, how to teach people to read, how to sort of elevate women um, who may be grappling with things like um, polygamy, polygamous marriages, and how to advocate for your rights and those kinds of contexts. So stuff that we wouldn't think of as necessarily very you know, dangerous unless you're coming from a very hardened sort of patriarchal position. But that kind of ethnographic interviewing, that kind of even archival research can help to work against some of these dominant narratives that get created and that so many folks in Indonesia actually still believe. So that's one sort of ethnographic way in. Um, you know, another way in that, that I participated in uh, was through more formal spaces. So using my work as an ethnographer, talking with survivors of 1965, hearing their stories, which were so much more complicated um, than the dominant narrative, right? So going to visit a nursing home for widows where, you know, I saw women with like scars, like up and down their arms from where they had been beaten, attacked with knives um, for being, for, for allegedly engaging in witchcraft who were, who were widows of, of 1965. So really thinking about what that experience was like for them, um, learning about their activism in the 1960s, learning about, about um, you know, what their everyday lives was, were like, um, and then speaking some of that truth, those more complex truths um, in formal spaces. And so this was a um, International People's Tribunal for 1965, which was held in The Hague. Um, I was one of the expert witnesses. This is me on the bottom image, um, the one I kind of had long hair back then. Um, so this was me talking on the record about what I had learned as an ethnographer um, that very much complicated the dominant narrative of, of this history um, and the also highlighted human rights abuses that had happened specifically towards women and sort of put that on the record. And this was not a tribunal actually that the Indonesian state participated in like every morning. Um, the judges of the tribunal would call on the Indonesian state to ask if anyone was present from the Indonesian state. And then of course, you know, they, they didn't show up. It was a people's tribunal um, that sought to collect information, um, to make a case against the state for gross, for gross violations of human rights, um, and then to create a report um, that, that sort of laid this all out publicly. So this was a very kind of typical political space, a very public space in which I was able to engage as something of a translator between my own research, my own more ethnographic research into people's experiences and lives um, and this formal and this formal political space. Um, and this was also, you know, an act in some ways, an act of care because there was a lot of conversation around this tribunal about whether people who had participated in it either as expert witnesses or as people giving firsthand accounts um, of their own experiences. Many people did come and give firsthand accounts of their own experiences. Oftentimes they testified from behind a screen. Um, as an international witness, you know, I, I didn't think that that was an option that I wanted, right? You know, I was okay with having my face out there, um, but there were many, many people and then many, many years afterwards where I had to decide, you know, is speaking truth to power, what are the possible risks of that, right? What's going to happen next time I arrive at the airport in Jakarta? You know, am I going to be arrested? Is something going to happen to my family? So thinking again about what are our commitments and what we're willing to risk and, you know, how, how care shows up, even in our willingness to speak things that, um, you know, that power would rather us not speak. Some other ways in which this, this shows up. Um, so there have been some efforts in Indonesia to put forth truth and reconciliation mechanisms. Um, Indonesia actually has the distinction of being the only country, as far as I know, to officially authorize the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and then have it be canceled by the government. It was declared unconstitutional by Indonesia's Supreme Court in 2005. Um, Indonesia's justice system is pretty is quite extraordinarily corrupt. 
Um, but without sort of this formal state mechanism, it's been very interesting as an ethnographer to see the many multi multiplying ways in which very local communities have used all kinds of different mechanisms to offer challenges to the dominant narrative, oftentimes using the arts. And I know we have an, an expert on that, um, Shelley Clay Robinson here, Robinson here today, who's done dissertation research on that. Um, but oftentimes using different forms of art. So here on the left, using using theater, here on the right, sort of survivors of this violence are getting together, um, you know, to, to dance, to learn how to do traditional dances as a way of sort of expressing their own experiences. So this really interesting flourishing and young people have done all kinds of things. I have some um, young, young uh, members of, of one of my activist communities in Bali who put together um, a music project called Prison Songs where they um, took poems that political prisoners had written um, and they got together with a couple of Indonesia's most famous punk bands or rock bands, talking about people who have like, I don't know, like 5 million followers, like on, on Instagram, right? You know, people who are very popular in Indonesia and they had them record um, the words and the poetry of these political prisoners to reach an audience that maybe wasn't aware um, of what had happened in the 1960s in Indonesia because there has been so much state oppression, but to record them in ways that would be appealing and engaging to young people, right? You know, like how, whatever, like how we might think about like not quite Taylor Swift, but like somebody with like five or 6 million followers. Um, so that's been very interesting, different ways in which different generations have used the arts. And so looking at that as an ethnographer, again, trying to understand how in spaces of the of more of the everyday that we might not consider um, to be inherently political allows spaces for us to think about how people are reworking the past and making uh, justice claims in the future. And then another space um, that I've been really interested in, specifically in my research in Bali. So this has been long-term ethnographic research again. Um, the, the amount of time that I've spent there adds up to you know probably like seven or eight years of actually working with people in the community on this as an ethnographer, sometimes for like a year at a time, sometimes just like over the summer, sometimes, you know, like last summer, I was able to be there for a month. <laughs> but thinking about how this manifests in people's very, very everyday relationships. Um, and so this is around um, notions of reincarnation. So in Hindu Balinese culture, unlike Hinduism in India, people are reincarnated into their own extended families. And typically when a baby is born, you would take them to a psychic who would tell you who that child has been reincarnated um, as, right? So, you know, when I took my first kid to the psychic, you know, she would, went into trance and you go with a bunch of women. Typically like it's women's business rather than, than men's business. Um, to go to, to these psychics. So you go with a group of women, usually the older women in the family who have a good memory um, of some of these people who have already passed on and are maybe now being reincarnated. Um, and so, you know, I took my daughter and the psychic goes into trance and she says like, she is her great, great grandmother on her paternal side. Um, and she was like this, like she had like Actually, I remember she said, like, she had these really long toes. Um, and, you know, she talked about how, like, she was, she was very outspoken. And so all the women who kind of come to the psychic are either nodding and saying, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Or sometimes they're like, no, actually. And they go off to another psychic. They're not accepting the first psychic. Sometimes you go to a second psychic. Sometimes you go to a third psychic. Sometimes you go to a fourth, fourth psychic. And I became very interested in how this very everyday practice of what we do when a baby is born, um, how that was a space for negotiating the return or the rejection of those who had been massacred in the, in the 1960s. Um, and even sometimes when, when, when the community did accept that this was the, reincarnated, the reincarnation of somebody who had been murdered, that would sometimes sort of shape that child's experience for many, many years. So there were kids in our community who, you know, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, when they would act up, 
you know, the parents in the community would say like, oh yeah, that's because he was like a communist party member, right? Um, and so even sort of that stigma would oftentimes get passed down into this collective memory um, for sort of years and years and years across generations. So I became very interested in how memory reproduces itself, not just in things like history textbooks, but in these very, very everyday practices, like what, what you do in that, when, when a child is born. Um, and I wouldn't have gotten at that if I had only shown up for a couple of weeks and sat down with people for, let's say, more structured interviews. I got at a lot of this from just being around, of having relationships of, of trust, um, of paying attention and being interested in things that may not have first seemed to be political or may not have first seemed to be about mass violence, right? Um, so things like what women do when a child is born, I'm not sure that somebody with a more kind of classic, maybe political science oriented approach towards mass violence and its aftermath would have thought to kind of query what happens in that space, right? But it turned out that that space of everyday ritual and the kind of, uh, kind of ritual work that women do actually was really, really central to how communities manage legacies of the past, came together, sort of rejected the past, accepted the past, it was a very, very, very vibrant space for my research, which I wouldn't have gotten at um, if I hadn't been very, very open to just seeing kind of everything that people were doing in these communities of survivors. And here's another image, which is quite, which is quite um, similar. It was um, sort of women, see this woman, the woman in the center there um, is a priest, a priestess, um, and she's sort of directing the ritual proceedings for a cremation ceremony for victims of 1965. So most of the people who were massacred in the, 19, in the 1960s were never properly attended to ritually. Oftentimes their remains were um, dumped in mass graves um, with you know, other, other, um, other remains, um, really difficult to kind of pull apart and have individual cremation ceremonies or maybe simply disappeared and nobody knows where they're buried. Um, so this was a, a mass cremation ceremony for victims of 1965 in which they created effigies of the dead. People came together to sort of pray and send them on to the next world because there's this real fear that people weren't reincarnating and um, because these proper rituals weren't done. So this was, again, like a very kind of informal space. This wasn't done under the auspices of the state. It was done very silently so that other people wouldn't really know what was going on, right? So there was a lot of um, kind of silence and kind of keeping this close. Um, but again, it was very, very powerful for the people who were doing this because for them, it almost meant that history could start to flow again rather than being blocked by the ability to do these rituals. Um, so being able to be in spaces like this as an ethnographer, um, I think I also contributed. So I helped to make some of the offerings for this, right? So um, it's typically work that's done by women who sort of sit there and here, let's see, I think I have a, an image of this. Um, oh, I'll show you later. Um, but so there are these offerings that are made with like palm leaves and flowers and pieces of coconut, sometimes like with old coins. And it's a very labor intensive process where women sit around and make these. And so I contributed, um, you know, to also doing some of the, 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 the gendered labor for this particular ritual. Um, so I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I just have two more slides. So I showed you the image earlier of the People's Tribunal in The Hague, right? So, you know, the sort of center of international justice and in which part of my role as an ethnographer, I framed as speaking truth to power. There are other colleagues there who are doing the same thing. Um, talking to many of the survivors of the mass of the genocidal violence, as well as their children, as well as their grandchildren in the aftermath. And this was talk that happened like in cafes in, in The Hague. This was talk that happened outside of the courtroom, like in the lobby, we were getting coffee and we were getting tea. A lot of them kind of started over like the multiple days of this tribunal of sort of expressing a sense of not feeling satisfied. And it wasn't just that the Indonesian state never showed up for this people's tribunal. It was that people wanted to feel sort of an emotional and communal shift 
um, around this. And, and legal spaces of speak, is speaking are not always the best ways to do this. Um, and so one of the things, I'm, I wasn't at all entirely responsible for this. This was kind of a collective decision that was made like in the, in the kind of, you know, the hallways, the, the spaces on the edges of the formal justice space was that we were going to do something ritual. Um, and so what happened, you can see like all of these candles and people were given slips of paper and they were light. We, just, we did a ritual basically. And it was a very kind of interdenominal ritual because there were Catholics, there were Muslims, there were Hindus, um, there were Buddhists and people were just sharing their, their wishes or their prayers. Um, and they lit candles and they held hands. And it was like a very sort of informal, but also very, very powerful way of taking that more formal space of justice and shaping it into something that could be collectively healing. Um, and, you know, sort of speaking of care, I wanted to include this image on the bottom right, which is of my oldest daughter, um, to whom I like owe so much in terms of um, the motivations for, for starting this research. And she was there also to testify on behalf of her grandparents and her family in Bali because she had um, this American passport, the other members of her family only had Indonesian passports and the Netherlands government made it incredibly difficult, makes it incredibly difficult if any of you are international students, you'll know what I'm talking about, um, to simply get a visa to go to the Netherlands for a week, right? You know, your bank accounts, your land certificate, you know, all of these things to prove you're not going to stay there, that you're going to go back to Indonesia. So even as she would think she was like 17, so she was sort of tasked on behalf of her family um, with going there to sort of carry their, their testimony and to carry um, their wishes for this tribunal. So even just as a mother and a daughter, you know, I was there as an expert witness and she was there as, um, you know, speaking on behalf of those who had actually suffered this and their hopes for the future. So care shows up in, in unexpected ways. It shows up in terms of our relationships with family. It turns up in our relationships, um, you know, with our communities. And so I wanted to end, um, just with, you know, these are, these are some pictures of, of me sort of being in these spaces, um, you know, again, some very, very long-term relationships with people who I have come to, you know, this is the most unacademic word of all, right, that I've come to love, that I've come to care about deeply, that I've come to serve in many ways, like put sort of my safety and comfort on the line for, um, and that I've tried to sort of, you um, you know, share benefits, whether they're financial benefits from the work that I do as a scholar, um, whether they're benefits in terms of networks, connections, you know, access to information, right? Um, and these are relationships that will endure as long as, as long as I endure, right? I mean, I'm just utterly entangled. So I wanted to kind of close, I'm, I'm happy to take questions, but I'm also curious at the end of this, um, for you all who are here on this call, again, on this Monday after spring break, where we've mysteriously lost an hour, um, to sort of think about how does care show up in your work? I'm curious, because, you know, I have, I have so much to say about it, but I still, I think sometimes there are these forces that push it out of our work, that make it seem like it's not scholarly, right? We don't cry when we're giving talks, right? You know, we, we, we sometimes like that part of ourselves like shows up like, yeah, outside of the academic sphere. So I wanted to put it right in the center and ask like how it shows up for you all. Yeah, and if folks wanna use the raise hand feature, if you wanna put it in the chat, we just have a few minutes left, but I feel like this is a really, I don't know, powerful question. And I think it'd be great to hear. So yeah, if folks wanna, uh, whether, you know, on video or not, audio or not, or in chat, that's fine. Uh, Shelly. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Leslie, for sharing all of this. There's so much I know that you try to cram into just 53 minutes. Um, but since our work is so similar, and I've been in a lot of these spaces too, I'll just share something that I know you have really encouraged me to do um, is to create friendships with the people I work with. And um, I've been accused by some political scientists as being too close to the people I work with. And I'm like, well, but <laughs> they're also humans. I am too a human. 
and they're sharing some really intimate things about their lives with me a lot of the time because they're just wonderful people. And so I'm like, oh, you know, I can't give them money or like, I don't have food with me to bring. I can't bring, you know, a million gifts with me from the U.S. when I go to Indonesia. But what can I bring to show this community that I care about them and I recognize they care about me? So sometimes for me, it's just very simply staying in touch with folks over WhatsApp when I'm back here in the U.S. or um, you know, sending them something on Instagram, like, hey, I saw you're doing this thing and I thought it was really great. Can I share this with my students or can I share this with other people? Um, and it's really like this building of relationships, Leslie, like you said, over time, over a lifetime, that not isn't just meaningful to me, but I can tell is really meaningful to the community too, because they see that there is somebody out there who is not part of their community who is concerned about their welfare and who is excited about their friendship and the things that they're excited about as well. So I appreciate you reinforcing some of these things that feel very unacademic and um, are make so much sense to me because it's part of life. It's part of human life. What do you think this thing is about, Shelly, about like you being accused of being too close? Like what would be the problem with, what would be the problem with being too close? I mean, I really think it gets to that whole feminization of, you know, care and research. And for the longest time, feelings were feminized, even though feelings mm. are part of the human experience. And so if you are close to people, you're going to be experiencing some things that are not um, objective, perhaps, even though all research is subjective. But I think there was this fear for the longest time of having experiencing emotion when you're doing research and how that makes you not legitimate. I'm not a legitimate researcher. Yeah, no, I think that that I think that that's a huge part of it. And I love that you're calling out the feminization of emotions, right? Because as I sort of said, right, for me to kind of share that I actually may feel something like, you know, I may feel, you know, love as well as a whole bunch of other complicated emotions for like some of the people that I work with. Um, that feels like really unacademic, right? That feels like very feminized. That feels kind of over the edge. I think we also have these very strong, and I'm looking in the chat from Alex, um, you know, a neutrality seminar, right? This idea that somehow we're supposed to be neutral, but I think, you know, and you may have experienced this as well, Shelly, I couldn't have done the work that I did if I was neutral. The people who I was talking with were very explicit about, about asking me, whose side are you on? Are you si on the side of the state that killed us? Or are you on the side of victim survivors, right? Um, and I had to articulate that. So any sort of claims to, well, I'm sort of seeing both sides or, you know, that's not my role as the scholar. People would have just pushed me out of, of, of their homes and communities, right? It was very, very important to them that I stood up and I said, you know, I stand against genocide and also that I recognize my own country's complicity in this genocide. Because as I said earlier, you know, the US and the UK and Australia were very much complicit in, in, in this violence. Um, and that was really important to people. Brianna. Hi, Brianna. Hi. I just, I want you to sort of talk about the more digital side of doing all of this. How do yeah. you build, how do you build those relationships? And also, are there other forms of ethnography that aren't necessarily going in and collecting the um, sort of individual testimonies and all those things? Yes. So there's a, especially since COVID, but even before, there's just been a wave of um, discussion about, about digital ethnography, about online ethnography. Um, I can share resources with folks. I know, you know, Shelly is our PhD alum, you know, also because of COVID, like did some, some digital ethnography, but I think it's something that more and more folks are doing. Um, it's more and more possible. 
This could be anything from looking at social media to engaging with people who have events or conversations in online spaces, right? So in my case, um, you know, I, I keep wanting to not have Facebook anymore, but the problem is that, you know, 80% of my Facebook quote friends are, are Indonesian and it's a way in which they communicate. Um, most Indonesians I know are also on like anywhere from like 18 to 98 WhatsApp groups at any given moment. So that's also a space where people are, um, are conversing about things that matter. So I'm just on a lot of online spaces, but those are, are kind of based on pre-existing relationships. But there are ways in which people are looking at what's, what are, what's happening in digital spaces and taking that as a source of data. So even if you just do a, um, you know, a, a, a search for works on digital ethnography, like you'll come up with, with more and more, um, more and more uh, experiments in, in, in that kind of domain. And I'd also encourage you, if she's willing to maybe talk to Shelly, who's online, if that's okay, I'm offering you up, Shelly, just because I think you know so much about this and you really grappled with this in your dissertation field research, um, or that you do a Methods Monday and talk about digital ethnography. I think that would be great. Um, I do want to uh, acknowledge that we're about at time. Um, I know I can stay a few minutes more, but um, just for the sake of of that, um, we're going to have Libby go ahead, and then I think um, might just kind of get some final comments from you, Dr. Dwyer, if that sounds good. Sounds great. Perfect. Okay, Libby, go ahead. Everything that you said, can you even do this type of research neutrally or can you use it to research like a side that you might not agree with? Like I'm sort of interested in the role of motherhood in right wing extremism. And like, can you go in and make friends with those mothers, even if you don't agree with their um, their viewpoints? And, and would that normalize their viewpoints when you don't really want to normalize them? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. And I will say that, you know, from, from um, in my own work, I did try at one point because I was also really interested in some of the complexities of per perpetratorhood um, in this context, right? You know, people had all kinds of reasons for, for committing violence. Um, sometimes it was because of hatred or ideology. Sometimes it was people who killed relatives because they wanted to be able to do the rituals for their death and have the body rather than risk having the body just be disappeared by the military, right? So there's some really complex reasons why people engaged in violence. Um, but when I tried to do that, actually, I got called out by communities of violence. I still remember being screamed at um, in the street by one man who said, why did you go over there? What did you need to know from them? And I gave some kind of BS sort of explanation about how important it was to see all the different sides of the conflict. And he was so angry. He's like, everything you need to know is like what we've been telling you, right? And so I realized I just couldn't and that somebody else maybe could, right? And that somebody else, you know, going to work with people who you don't, who you don't agree with, does it legitimize? maybe do you need to legitimize like in your in your writing and sort of how you're how you're um how you're analyzing this to what extent does that like end up feeling like a betrayal of the people who you've developed these relationships with i think it's very hard and i think it's very hard to kind of carry that kind of work emotionally um and so i think there's a number of things to think about right you know how do you write about it how do you explain to people what you're doing um, how do you sort of hold that space in your own heart, in your own mind um, for your own non-neutrality around, let's say, violent white extrem extremism um, and still maybe be able to do that work? I think it's more challenging even than the work that I do. I don't know if that really answered it, Libby. I would be happy to have a conversation with you like more in depth as you try to work through that because I think there are a lot of examples out there of ethnographers who have worked because they felt it was important to um, with people who whose views they they did not um, accord with, yeah, yeah, it's really important that work that you're proposing to do, right? We need to we need to understand that from the inside, but it's it's a hard it's hard labor. Thanks. 
Well, I, I, I wish we had even more time to go on because this is such a rich conversation and I really appreciate um, seeing the contributions from folks in the chat as well. Um, but I just want to say thank you, Dr. Dwyer. This was a really enriching discussion. Um, I wanted to say if there's any, are there any kind of last things you want us to kind of carry forward uh, as we move on into our lives, whether, you know, our research and everything, but also just like we are human too. So personally. <laughs> yeah, continue, continue the conversations, right? Talk about these things with your colleagues. Talk about these things like with your faculty members to the extent that you're able to do either of those things. I'm happy if anybody wants to have a conversation with me, but I think, yes, recognize um, that they're, yeah, that, 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 that we're human. That's not something that we excise from our work. That's actually something that enriches our work, right? Having emotions, recognizing people's everyday lives, um, taking that sort of path less traveled, like through, through our thinking about conflict, that enriches our work. And I believe that that's something very important that the field needs. Yeah, that would be my concluding comment. That's really powerful. Thank you so much for joining us here. Um, to the folks again in, uh, who joined, please keep an eye out for further Methods Mondays. Um, yeah, so just really excited to hear everything that you said, and I hope everyone um, is able to go forth into their lives with, with uh, these considerations in heart. So. Thank you all. Thank you.